Hello, this is Maraj Patel, and today we're going to be talking about Unit 11, which is States of Matter, just like I said. And so, today we're going to specifically be talking about States of Matter and how, um, how gases, liquids, and solids gain and lose energy. And then we're going to be talking about intermolecular forces, which are forces between different atoms. And... Uh, and it's, it's abbreviated with IMAX. And so here we have the first PowerPoint, which is all about uh, states of matter. And so the main difference between each of the following phases, you can see from the picture, notice how gases have so much space in the middle. Liquids have a little bit less space, but they can still move. And solids are tightly packed, and they barely have anything touching. And so the main difference is, between the phases is the distance between the particles and so like I just talked about how gases have the most space while solids have barely any space in the middle and uh, this all has to do with two factors and the factors are kinetic energy of the particles so the speed versus IMAFs or intermolecular attractive forces between the particles or the forces holding these together and we'll talk more about this on the next PowerPoint, which we'll have in this video. And so, now we're going to be ta t looking at kinetic molecular theory of gases. And so, these are the five parts, or uh, five parts of the theory that describe how gas particles move. And so, the five parts are first is that they gas particles have a negligible volume or pretty much mean that they have such a tiny volume that it's practically nothing and it's practically nothing compared to the distance between so pretty much gas has a lot of distance between the particles and so as you can see that uh, the distance between them is almost like 10 times as much as the size of the particle and the second one is that they have negligible attractions because they're so far apart. So because we have so much distance that they do not like, they don't even really attract to each other. So first one is that they have a lot of space compared to their size between them. And the second one says that they don't like pretty much attract each other. And then the second part says, I mean the third part says that they are in constant random motion so you, as you can see the gas are just in no pattern at all they're just moving around and bouncing around and they just pretty much just hit things and hit each other or the wall and then the fourth part says that they have perfectly elastic collisions and we'll talk what about what are elastic collisions and what are inelastic so we have these two diagrams elastic collision and inelastic collision so an elastic collision is a collision where once the particle bounces, see, it comes back to the same point. So it pretty much once it bounces, it has the same energy as it started with, and hence it comes back. But we have inelastic collisions, which happens when you bounce a ball. So when you bounce a ball, you bounce it, and then it comes back a little high, then bounces again and a little lower, and then a little lower until it hits the floor but gas particles are different and so that they hit something but they come back and bounce with the same amount of energy so pretty much elastic is just like a rubber band it just like comes back to its original position and then inelastic does not come back so pretty much they do not lose energy when they bounce or they don't transfer kinetic energy and the second part is that Gases, their average kinetic energy, or Ke, is directly proportional to the temperature. So if we increase temperature, the kinetic energy will increase, or another word for kinetic energy is pretty much the speed of the particle. So if we increase temperature, the speed will increase of the particles. And so while we're talking about temperature and speed and kinetic energy, here are uh, the three scales of temperature. Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit. Kelvin uh, starts at z uh, zero, which is when 
which is absolute zero or when particles don't move and then uh, that's negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit and it's also uh, negative 270 degrees Kelvin I mean Celsius sorry about that then we have 270 degrees Kelvin which is um, the freezing of water freezing point and so is 0 degrees Celsius and 32 degrees Fahrenheit and then we have 212 degrees Fahrenheit which is boiling of water and then 100 degrees Celsius and and 373 and um, so the conversion factor from Celsius to Kelvin is this so we just pretty much add 273 to the degrees in Celsius and that's how we get degrees Kelvin and the unique thing about Kelvin is that at zero degrees Kelvin particles stop moving so this is like the lowest temperature that atoms can move so at zero atoms start stop moving so they're just perfectly still so that's unique about Kelvin and so now we're gonna compare the the kinetic energy and space between solid liquid and gas and so solids have very low kinetic energy but they're still moving so technically solids are not at uh, like not moving it but they're still vibrating then liquids the atoms are very tightly packed but they can flow around each other like this so notice how they're still moving back and forth a little bit and uh, they have a little more kinetic energy and they flow and then gases have the highest kinetic energy and they expand to the size of the container so that's the cool thing about gases they expand to the size of the container and uh, the cool thing is that they're compressible because they have so much space in the middle uh, we can we can crush them together and so the space in the middle decreases but it's still a gas and so if you just think about if you're compressing something it's easier to compress a less densely packed uh, object so if you have like for example if you have dirt and if we pack if we're we or we're packing or compressing loosely packed dirt it's so much easier to compress because there's a lot of air and space in the middle but if we have densely like packed dirt like if like a truck ran over your yard the dirt underneath is very densely packed so it's harder to even pack more or you know compress so because gases have a lot of space it's easy to compress and that's why gases can be pressurized so if you ever think about like car tires gas is very tightly packed in there and so um, that's what causes the tire to have a lot of pressure and the and it's special and it's only unique to gases because they have a lot of space in the middle and so now we're going to be talking about phase changes and so here we have solid liquid and gas gases and then so um, the the red arrows on the diagram are going to going to de demonstrate or represent energy absorbed and blue arrows represent energy release so if energy is released it loses energy energy absorbs means that it gains energy from the surroundings and so here melting if we have a solid and it melts to a liquid energy is absorbed so the solid pretty much takes in some heat and uh, it turns into a liquid then we have freezing which is exact opposite so we have a liquid it's moving around it has some energy but it loses energy so it heats up the surroundings and makes a solid and then we have liquids turning to gases that's again absorbing energy so we have to heat up a liquid to make it a gas and then gases when they condense they lose energy and it's released into the surroundings and then same thing with solid to gas that's known as sublimation if you haven't heard and a unique thing is that m not many element or compounds do this and one common compound we breathe in out every day we breathe out every day is carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide actually does d perform sub undergo sublimation in deposition so sublimation just like uh, vapor vaporization it has to gain energy from the surroundings and so that would be endothermic and then 
again, going from gas to like just like the condensation, deposition is just like it, and so energy is lost, so that it heats up the surroundings. And so now we're going to talk about specifically about each one. So when if we're freezing something, the it's a liquid. It starts out as a liquid and loses energy and becomes a solid. So here would be like the little formula for it: liquid loses energy. So this is what this is what this represents. So energy is given off and it forms a solid. And so it loses kinetic energy so that atoms or particles move slower and they stay s more still. And then the exact opposite is for melting. So melting, we have a solid and it gains energy. So that's what represents these little arrows coming in. And then it turns into a liquid. And so this would be an example of endothermic reaction or a process because heat is coming in and then liquid going to solid is exothermic because energy is being released. And here we have vaporization and there's two different types. A vaporization is pretty much the pretty much like sort of like boiling, so like uh, liquids turning into gas. And so the first thing is that we have to know is that energy is definitely added into the system so energy is added to a liquid and it forms a gas and so it's definitely endothermic and we have two different types of what I was talking about evaporation and boiling evaporation the important part is where it happens so evaporation happens only on the surface so here notice how only water molecules are evaporating at the surface and then boiling is when they vaporize at any part in the liquid so it can be in the middle it can be at the very bottom on the sides so boiling is when liquid turns to gas beneath the surface so anywhere but the surface is when it's boiling and so here we have another picture so this is just to give you sort of like a visual so we have energy entering so the energy going into liquid is represented by this little flame here and then the the it heats up the water and the water leaves and it's uh, and it's now a gas so when we boil water the energy we give into it is from the flame or heat source and then we have the opposite which is condensation and um, you know how uh, if you have a cold cup of like lemonade and you leave it on your counter or table and so eventually water will get on the sides and this has to do with condensation and so condensation is when um, gas t is when gas turns into liquid and has to do with losing kinetic energy so pretty much the gas touches this ice and so once it touches the ice it gives off energy into the ice and so the gas loses the energy but the energy is still there and it goes into the, to the cup because it touched it and pretty much it forms water on the sides and it's com it's a common misconception because most people think that condensation is water leaking from inside but it's not it's just that the water vapor touches the glass and it loses energy so it's exothermic reaction and we're left with water and so here's a quick question is the water in the glass becoming cooler or warmer so if the glass is in the center I mean it's all cold and the room is warm and there's condensation happening this gas is warm so when it touches something cold the gas I mean the the water would get cold and uh, once it loses energy the heat has to go somewhere so the heat goes into the glass. So technically, in this, the glass is becoming warmer because of this heat transfer from hot to cold. Remember, heat is always transferred from, say with me, hot to cold, hot to cold, hot, hot, hot to cold. And so here's a quick quiz to see what you learned. So according to kinetic molecular theory, gas particles a are attracted to each other, B are in constant random motion, 
C have the same kinetic energy, or D have significant volume. So, kinetic molecular theory is the theory that states that um, gas particles have five characteristics, and so let's just go back to them to see what they are. And so, number one is that they have negligible volume so pretty much they don't weigh I mean they don't take up as much space as the space between them so they have a lot of space in the middle number two they have they do not attract to each other so they, they're not attracted number three is that they're constant random motion so they're always moving four is that they have elastic collisions so whatever they hit, they uh, they bounce off like this. So whatever they hit, they come back to where they were. So they don't lose energy when they bounce. Number five is that the average kinetic energy or the speed of their motion is directly proportional to temperature. So if we increase temperature, the gas particles move faster. And so those are the five characteristics. And so, let's go back to those questions. So, according to kinetic molecular theory, gas particles, and so, uh, let's just go through all the answers and see which ones are false. So, A, are attracted to each other. Kinetic molecular theory states that uh, they aren't attracted to each other because they have so much space in the middle. So, that's definitely false. So, eliminate A. Don't even look at it. And so, let's look at B are in constant random motion that is correct because gas particles like in the diagram they're always moving and they're always just hitting random things so they are in constant random motion and if you had to you could have looked at C and D and noticed that both of them are wrong because D says they have significant volume when gas particles do not have significant volume so this is a trickster and uh, C doesn't make sense they have same kinetic energy that doesn't make sense at all. And then let's look at number two. The average kinetic energy of the particles in a substance is directly proportional to A, the molar mass, B, density, C, temperature, or D, size. So if you remember the last principle, uh, gases pretty much, uh, ha they move or they have, in, have their speed relates to what? And we have a picture of thermometer, so that's a good clue. So just remember that gases, their speed of the particles has to do with temperature. So for example, if we have a high temperature, the gas particles will be moving fast. And if you have a low temperature, the gas particles will be moving slowly, like this. So always remember, temperature is energy in chemistry. So if there's a lot of heat or temperature, there's uh, fast particles. If there's not much heat, then these are slow particles. And so, question three, compared to liquids and solids, gases are easily compressible or compressed because the particles in a gas, A, are attracted to each other significantly, B, are spaced relatively far apart, C, are extremely small, or D, move in constant random motion. So, remember my analogy of compressing compressing a gas to like compressing uh, a spacey dirt so like think about loose dirt so it's easy to compress because there's a lot of space in the middle so if you think about compressing dirt it's very hard to compress dirt that's already been compressed because there's no more space same thing with gas particles if there's a lot of space in the middle it's easy to compress and that's the same thing with gases gases because they have a lot of space they can be easily compressed, but liquids and solids, they are packed very tight. So that's why liquids and solids can't be compressed, but gases can, because they have tons of space. And so, what is negative 88 degrees Celsius in Kelvin? And so, here we have um, negative 88 degrees Celsius, and if you remember the formula, you just add 273 to whatever it is in Celsius to get in Kelvin. So, if you think about it, subtract 88 from 273, 
And if you just used your approximation skills, you could have figured out that the answer must have been A because these answers are so far apart. And if you think about it, if you subtract 73 from uh, 273, you'll get 200. But if you, and 88 is pretty close to 73 or subtracting. So it must not be far from 200. And the only answer close to 200 is this one right here. And so we have a cup of water right here. And so uh, a process that will occur in this cup of water right here is evaporation, condensation, both of them or none of them. So here we have a cup of water and these are particles. And so which of the following is happening? So is evaporation happening? And if you look at the cup of water, evaporation is definitely happening because look, notice how this particle moves up. And so definitely, and it's also happening on the surface. So that's definitely evaporation, check right there. So evaporation must be in the answer. So it can't be B by itself or none of the above. So it's either A or C. And so now let's look at B and see if condensation is happening. So is condensation happening in this picture? So definitely it is because we see these gas particles and they move down into the liquid. So definitely the gas particle is cooling down and forming the liquid. So this is definitely having evaporation and condensation. So it's definitely both A and B. And if I were you and I had to go in a hurry, I saw two different arrows. So that means two different processes must be happening. Because one's going up and one's going down. So definitely there's only two different processes. So it must be both. So, so if you ever had to, you know, be in a rush, you can always use your, uh, you know, knowledge of, uh, you know, tests and just know that. And so that is it for this PowerPoint. And so we have one more. And so uh, here is the next PowerPoint, which is all about IMAFs. And so before we talk about IMAFs, so we're going to talk about bonding in general. And so we have bonding, and it's divided into ionic and covalent bonding. Ionic bonding is like what we talked about way back in the day. And so ionic bonding is like bonding between two different, a metal and a nonmetal. And the electrons are transferred. So think of ionic as transferring electrons. Then there are covalent bonds when el uh, different elements, they share electrons. And again, covalents are split into polar and nonpolar bonds. Polar bonds are caused by when electrons aren't shared equally. So one element sort of uh, hogs a little bit more of the electrons than the other. And it causes slightly charging of the bonds, and that's what forms poles. Nonpolar is the exact opposite, so the elements share equally. So th th think of polar, nonpolar as like good friends sharing something. They share equally. While polar is like a bully and or like a mean brother and mean sister. They don't get along, so the older one sort of hogs the goodies and stuff. And th th these type of bonds are all intramolecular bonds. So these are bonds within a molecule, and these are very strong. So ionic covalent are both very strong bonds. Now we're going to go to the other side of the spectrum here, and we're going to have intermolecular forces. So be careful when you see intra and inter. Intra is within a molecule. Inter is between two molecules. And so here's a diagram to show you the difference between inter and intra. Intramolecular forces or attractions are within a molecule. So it's important to know your prefixes in science, just like endo and exo. Endo is inside, so temperature or heat moving in, and exo is heat moving out because exo means like exit. Then we have intermolecular forces which is the bond in this little middle here. 
And so intermolecular attractions are between two different molecules or, uh, you know, atoms and stuff. And so intra is strong. So think of intra strong, intra strong. And then inter is weak. So think of weak bonds for inter. And a good way to remember, like, just think of international. So if it's international, it's between nations. But if you think of intranational, it's just within one country. So think of international as like between different countries. And same thing with this. Intermolecular is between two different molecules. And so you can think of them as nations and as this little bond as like a little agreement between them. So that's a weird way to think about it. So an IMAF stands for intermolecular attractive forces. So I M A F. And so the cool thing is that IMAFs or this li these little attractions between molecules determine physical properties like states of matter, so solid liquid gas, boiling points, melting points, and viscosity. And so here we fill out our chart. So we have intra and inter. Inter is a weak bond. Then we have uh, one type, which is here. And then we're going to talk about first van der Waals forces. And van der Waals is just a name of a scientist who found these two bonds. And then we're going to first talk about dispersion forces, which is relatively simple. Van der Waal forces are split into two categories. And so this is the first one dispersion forces and here we have a model of an atom and we're going to first talk about it and then define it so here we have electrons and notice how the electrons electrons are always moving you probably know that electrons are moving and sometimes they move so that most of the electrons are on one side so it forms a partial negative charge like this and partial positive and we see this a lot in polar and polar bonding and so just like a polar bond, it forms two little semi-poles, I can call it. And so the, the dispersion force is caused by temporary dipoles caused by motion of electrons. So these electrons sometimes are lucky and they move to both to one side. And so the atom or molecule becomes slightly positive and negative. And so if we have a ton of different uh, molecules like this, so we have slightly negative and positive charge negative positive negative positive they can attract each other so the positives just like magnets will attract to the negatives positives with negative and uh, it forms like a little bond and so even though this bond is weak it's something so this is one of the IMAFs and the cool part about this uh, IMAF is that it is sort of free so all molecules do this no matter what the heck it is all molecules have dispersion forces and th but the bad part is that this is a pretty weak one because these electrons are moving so once they move away they're, they're gone so like so for example if this electron just uh, this meets here every one second it only happens for one second so it's, it has to be on they have to be on the same side for this to happen and so that's the first van der Waals. Then we have the second one, which is dipole-dipole forces. And we talked a lot about dipoles in the polar bonding unit. And then we're going to talk about H bond. And so the last part, the last van der Waals is dipole-dipole. And dipoles, like we talked about, are those, uh, you know, partial charges in polar molecules. And so dipole dipole forces are caused by permanent dipoles from polar molecules and so you know how molecules they in covalent bonds they share electrons so H shares with chlorine to form an octet but the chlorine we know is more electronegative because it hot and then it hogs all these electrons so hydrogen has slightly less electrons than chlorine and chlorine because it took all the electrons it becomes negative Hydrogen is positive, same thing on this atom. And so, uh, just like the dispersion, the positive and negatives like to attract, just like a magnet. And this forms a little bond, and it's called a dipole-dipole force. 
So this is the second type of IMAF. And so this this uh, bond is the second strongest. And then we have H bonds, which stand for hydrogen bonds or hydrogen bonding. And so here we have a water molecule because we have H2 and then one oxygen. And notice how they're sharing uh, electrons. And what is this called exactly? It's called a Lewis dot structure. We did this back in like maybe two units ago in covalent bonding. So, and so these two different molecules, they're charged because this oxygen again chogs the sort of the electrons from the hydrogen because hydrogen's a little weak, puny little kid, and then oxygen's a big bad bully. So oxygen takes in these electrons, and so it forms these little dipole moments, and so. The, the positive and negatives like to attract and this is called a hydrogen bond when a hydrogen attracts to another um, another substances like negative uh, anion and so um, hydrogen bonds are caused by an electron deficient hydrogen atom bonded to a N over F so think of NOF so they're caused by an uh, electron deficient hydrogen atoms attraction or attracted to a very small very electronegative n over f atom on a nearby molecule so pretty much a hydrogen atom is bonded to a n over f so in this case hydrogen is bonded to oxygen and so this hydrogen has electrons stolen by oxygen and so this hydrogen wants to get with a negative oxygen of another molecule so this is another molecule and this is one molecule and so it likes to attract to negative things because the hydrogen's positive and this only happens with nitrogen oxygen and fluorine so the hydrogen must be bonded with n o or f so just think of NOF 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 sounds pretty silly and hydrogen bonds are the strongest IMAF so that's pretty cool and so the cool thing is that you can tell whether it will form a hydrogen bond by looking at its atom uh, Lewis dot structure. And so uh, here are some compounds and we're going to see whether um, they can form hydrogen bonds. And NH3 definitely can because it has an N with the I mean with the H so nitrogen with hydrogen so it's definitely check. But this one can't because hydrogen's bonded with the sulfur. So is sulfur part of N or F? Nope, it isn't. So sorry sulfur, you can't form a hydrogen bond. And then let's look at carbon. So carbon is also definitely not part of NOF. NOF is like an elite group just for nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So carbon is also kicked out. And uh, this one, at first it tricked me, but this one even though it has a hydrogen and fluorine, if we look at the Lewis dot structure, the carbon is bonded to fluorine. So if carbon is bonded to fluorine, it's not a, it can't form a hydrogen bond because hydrogen must be bonded to fluorine. So even though this looks like it might form a hydrogen bond, we have to draw the Lewis dot structure to figure it out. So this one is not a uh, hydrogen bonding molecule. But this one is definitely because H can only bond to F in this one. So it's definitely N O or F. And then this one also forms a hydrogen bond because H is bonded to O, N O or F. And so it's always important if you don't know, like if there's like multiple possibilities that they can bond to, we have to draw the loose dot structure to make sure. And so here are special properties of water caused by the strong IMAFs or hydrogen bonding and one is that they have form a higher boiling point so pretty much because water is attracted to itself so water loves itself it doesn't want to let go or you know turn to a liquid because when water is a gas it's not attracted remember gases don't attract to each other so they want to stay together and they want to stay as a liquid and they have a high surface tension or pretty much they they can hold some weight because of the water attraction 
So because of these little attractions to water molecules, these little bonds can end up holding these little insects or, you know, these like water walking animals because of these tight bonds. And so that's why little insects can like walk on water. And also, hydrogen bonds make the solid or ice less dense than water because once we freeze uh, these bonds, these bonds actually get stronger because of because if the water moves slower, they are uh, they are more likely to form more bonds, so they take up more space. So they form like this little crystal lattice, and because they took more space, they uh, and they weigh exactly the same as water. They are less technically less dense because they have more space for the same amount of mass. And look at water here. Water here has less hydrogen bonds, so there's more densely packed because the water can get up close, but these hydrogen bonds prevent them from getting close. So that's what causes ice to float. And then the last part is viscosity. And viscosity has to do with, uh, with a uh, liquid's, uh, liquid's ability to resist flow. So if something has a high viscosity, it's sort of like syrup. So syrup barely moves. But then if it's something has a low viscosity like water, it moves crazy fast. And so uh, viscosity increases with uh, weaker IMAFs. Or no, no, no. Viscosity, sorry. Viscosity increases with stronger IMAFs because if we have more attractions, the water or whatever liquid wants to stay together so it won't move like a liquid. And it decreases with lower or higher temperature. So if you think about it, if something has a higher temperature, it has less IMAFs. So we want viscosity to increase, so we need more IMAFs. So remember how we talked about water? If we cool it down, it forms more bonds so it gets wider. So if we cool something down, it uh, it uh, forms a uh, higher viscosity, but viscosity decreases with higher temperature because when we heat up something, the particles move faster, and so it's hard to form those bonds at the right time. So viscosity increases with more bonds because they want to stay together, and decreases when we have higher temperature because we have less of these IMAFs and the particles are moving faster so they can move more liquidy. So that is why if you warm up syrup, it'll move much faster than if it's cold. So notice how like cold syrup moves very slowly, but hot syrup moves super fast like this. And so now we're gonna rate the bonds in order from weakest to strongest. So we sort of talked about this. So we have dispersion forces, which are caused by temporary dipoles and so, pretty much, dispersion forces are very weak because if these electrons just move a little bit, like all the time, they are, they're always moving, then this whole thing won't work. And so, dispersion forces is super weak. Then we have dipole-dipole moments, which are caused by um, polar molecules, and they're always positive or negative, so there's no worrying about if these electrons move. And so these are somewhat stronger than dispersion, but the strongest is definitely hydrogen bonding because hydrogen bonds, the hydrogens are the same size as nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And so they have a very strong bond. And remember, hydrogen always has to be bonded with N or F, and hydrogen can't be not bonded. It has to be bonded with these three elements. And so here's a quick quiz to see what you learned. Which of the following IMAFs is caused by a motion of electrons? Polar bonds, dispersion forces, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonds. And so we sort of talk about this, so I'm sure most of you know that dispersion forces is what is caused by the movement of electrons. And so again, the electrons, let's just say cluster to one side, forms a pole, slightly negative pole, and slightly positive, and so they attract. Then we have question two, which of the following bond types is the strongest bond? And so uh, is it dipole, dipole, dispersion, covalent bonds, or hydrogen bonds? And so 
This one says, which of the following bond types is the strongest? Not necessarily IMAF. So we can include covalent bonds. And we talk about intra and inter. Inter are the IMAF. So like dipole-dipole, dispersion, hydrogen bonds. Those are all inter. And if you remember, inter bonds, intermolecular bonds are very weak. So a covalent bond must be an intramolecular bond because it connects atoms within a molecule so definitely covalent bonds is the strongest type of bond and most of most most times people get confused with this question because they think of the strongest IMAF but this is strongest bond in general so hydrogen bonds is the strongest IMAF but it's not as strong as covalent bonds which are super strong they're in like a different league compared to these IMAFs. These IMAFs are a little puny, like they're part of like the weak league. And then covalent bonds are part of like the major league. And then here we have question three. Molecules have hydrogen bondings when a hydrogen atom, A, is attracted to other ions, B, affected by the motion of electrons, C, shared with electron pairs, D, bonded to N or F and attracted to a very small electronegative atom on a neighboring molecule. And remember, Hydrogen bonds can only happen with N or F, and the only answer that says that is D. So just by knowing a little part about hydrogen bonds, you can just jump to D. And even if you did look at D, it seems correct. And often on tests, the very long answers are like usually true, be unless a very short answer says the same exact thing, because these very long answers uh, sort of like describe it in detail and you can sort of tell that's the correct answer so just as a little tip at least on teacher tests very long answers very like are most descriptive and if they're correct they're usually it and so hydrogen bonds are in fact do bond with N or F and they're attracted to a very electronegative atom on another molecule and so, which of the following is caused by H bonding in water? A, low density, B, electric tension, C, higher boiling point, or D, dispersion forces. And um, let's just go through each one and talk about it. So, low density is definitely caused, but this is in ice, not in water. In water, uh, hydrogen bonds do what? They don't make it lower density. That's what happens when you freeze water. Electrical tension, we didn't even talk about electricity, so get the heck out of here, you electrical. So A and B are definitely out. C is in fact correct because if we have H bonding or attractions between water, the water wants to stay together and it doesn't want to boil, so it will have a higher boiling point because they have to break these bonds. And dispersion forces is just an IMAF, and so... This is not caused by H bonding. H bonding is a totally different thing. So the correct answer is C. And so which of the following uh, processes shows the breaking of intermolecular attractions? So is it first one, H2O to H2O from solid to liquid, Fe2O3 as a solid to 2Fe and 3O2, F2 to as a gas to 2F as a gas or NH3 liquid to 3H2 gas N2 to gas. And so intermolecular forces are attractions between different molecules. And so intermolecular forces have nothing to do with chemicals, chemical formulas. So all of the chemical reactions or all the answers where the chemical changed from this to something else are wrong. So B and D are definitely are chemical reactions. These would be examples of decomposition reactions because we have one product and I mean react and breaks up into two products. So this is wrong, this is wrong. But C is also wrong because we broke a F2 into two separate Fs. So we broke a bond inside the molecule. But A is correct because we have the same exact molecule, but we just broke the bonds in the middle because solids have so many more uh, bonds in the middle. And then we 
heated it up and broke it so it formed a liquid. So we broke up those intramolecular forces holding it together. And so that is it for today. So today we talked about um, we talked about states of matter and how uh, atoms or you know molecules they change states of matter by gaining or losing heat. And so remember, solid to liquid, you gain heat because you m you melted, so you got more energy. Liquid to gas is also gaining heat, and also solid to gas is also gaining heat. So those will be examples of endothermic reactions because they gained heat. And the opposite is true for like gas to liquid, that's exothermic or con condensation. So is uh, freezing because you have to release heat and same thing as gas to solid. So those are endo and exothermic. So exothermic, remember, is le uh, heat being released. Endothermic is heat being absorbed. And so um, then we talked about IMAF. So we have three types of bond. Hydrogen bonding, which is with N, O, or F. And it, the atoms have to be polar. So just remember NOF with hydrogen it forms hydrogen bonds with other molecules. And uh, then there's dispersion forces, which are the weakest type. So remember, dispersion weak. And dispersion forces are caused by the little uh, electrons moving on the sides of the molecule. And so if the electrons cluster to one side, they form a slightly negative area. And they, you know... Um, like to attract with the positive other um, molecules. And then there's dipole-dipole, which are permanent dipoles caused by polar bonding. And so, like just like in this picture, we have these little dipoles forming. And so they like to bond. And so just remember your three types of IMAFs. And remember that they are very weak because they attract different atoms. And so... The next video is going to all be all about calometry, calometry and phase change diagrams. So until next time, so until next time, I'll see you later and I hope you have a good day.